Who can recognize what that is? This might need to come with a trigger warning. Mark, what is that? That's the East Mixmaster, you're right. Um, which is why it may need to come with a trigger warning because uh, this is actually the, con the construction company doing all the work is very proud of the work they're doing at the East Mixmaster. I'm sure we'll love it once they're done, right? <laughs> So um, road construction is really kind of fascinating to me because I don't understand anything about it. Um, and I'm always just amazed at quite how much dirt there is to move and sort of pile all in one place. And then they've got great big machines that's job is to pile all the dirt in some other place. And then eventually they've piled all the dirt in enough places, enough different times that they can actually put the road on top of it. I don't understand exactly how any of that works. I understand enough to know that you need a really hard, solid surface to build your road on. And then there's lots of hills and inclines and declines and whatnot involved in that whole process. Um, but how you get from here was not the road you're looking for to here is the road you're looking for is just fascinating, right? And there is so much that goes into it. And the process just has to unfold the way the process unfolds. Nanya is going to invite us into a scripture reading this morning all about road construction. Let us pray. God of mercy, you promised never to break your covenant with us. Amid all the changing words of our generation, speak your eternal word that does not change. Then may we respond to your gracious promises with faithful and obedient lives through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Today's scripture reading is from Isaiah chapter 40, verses 1 through 11, which can be found on pages 1037 to 1039 of the Old Testament of your pew Bibles or on the screen. Please join me in reading. Comfort, oh comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term, that her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hands double for all her sins. A voice cries out, in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all people shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out, and I said, what shall I cry? All people are grass. Their constancy is like flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion. Herald of good tidings, lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem. Herald of good tidings, lift it up, do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. See the Lord comes with might, and his arm rules for him. His reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms and carry them in his bosom and gently lead the mother sheep. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The prophet says, comfort and speak and cry and prepare and make straight and get you up and lift up and say and see. There's a lot for us to do all of a sudden as we listen to the prophet Isaiah today. 
And there's so much for us to do that is really about proclaiming the good news of what God is doing, but still it seems a little bit like at least some of that good news that we are proclaiming depends somehow on the rest of that stuff that we are doing, which seems a little naive when you think about it, right? Because the prophets also write that All people are like grass, and human loyalty is like a flower blossom that fades and falls off and blows away. And I'm personally very aware of that part of the truth, the way that we are just deeply unreliable, even just as mere announcers of the good news, let alone as the ones who are responsible for ourselves with dirt under our fingernails, building the world that Jesus intended for the world to be. Now you'll tell me to be a little more uh, fair to us all and acknowledge, well, we all screw up and that's okay, but that's the whole question, isn't it? We all screw up. We are all so frail. Why would God depend on us? Why would God not just use some direct miracles to just whip everything into shape and then we can just move into the world that God intended for it to be? Surely the God who created the mountains in the first place would be able to level just a few of them. But God counts on human beings to remove the barriers between ourselves and the world as God intends it. We're at this turning point uh, within the biblical narrative. We're coming uh, to sort of the, the tragic end of the Old Testament history when the Babylonian Empire, you don't need to know who that is, but they're big and powerful. They come and they conquer the people of Judah and they destroy Jerusalem and they exile the people off into a land that they don't know where they are not home. And the prophet Isaiah speaks into that reality speaks into that reality and reads all of that turmoil as a consequence of the people's unfaithfulness. And it is really uncomfortable. It is really uncomfortable to read those first 39 chapters of the book of Isaiah as they talk about judgment and despair that are just coming upon us because this is the world that we have created for ourselves. Well, now that has happened. There's like a big pause, a giant breath in before the beginning of chapter 40 when this new voice speaks this new word into the people's exile and says, God is ready to get you out of exile so you get ready for that to happen. And it's not entirely clear how we are supposed to get ready. It's not entirely clear how these exiles in the land of Babylon are supposed to go build a highway through the desert. It's not entirely clear to me how they're supposed to go sing from mountaintops in Judah where they haven't even been for decades now. But God is about to get the people out of exile. And so the people have to get ready. The people are going to have a role in building the way to their very own freedom. Contemporary American Christians sometimes overstate the idea that we are in exile somehow. We have, and probably rightly in a lot of ways, been losing a lot of our cultural dominance in recent decades. And that is understandably disorienting and confusing for us. And it's certainly fair to say that the powers of the world are not universally guided by God's values and relationships. Did I understate that enough? The powers of the world, the decision-making forces in the world, those who have the ability to impose their will on us are not universally guided by God's values and ways of being. And we know fear and greed and hatred have such power in our world, but we also know that we are called to live differently than that. But we know that when we're called to live differently than that, we have to do more than just make one single choice. We are called again and again to 
reshape and reshape again the lives that we live and our ways of being in the world, but it often feels like we are just constantly rebuilding our lives from the earthwork up. And it would be a lot easier to have God just do it, to have God just take care of this for us. But we have a calling here in the infinite, sometimes inscrutable wisdom of God. We have a calling to be part of making this world as God would intend it to be. The prophet objects. Grass withers and flower fades and all flesh is that kind of fading, withering grass. That is us. But you've noticed grass, right? You've noticed the thing about grass is that even though it withers and it fades every year, grass can change the world. Grass creates ecosystems. Grass generates soil. Every year of grass that withers and fades lays down another layer of residue that becomes part of the soil of every future generation. Every year of grass that withers and fades lays down just a little bit of that future generation of soil. And soil is not just some thing. It's not some external kind of thing. Soil is generations of plants and animals and microbes all living together. Soil is a living community that shares life with each other and with the future. So maybe... Being withering grass and fading flowers is not actually such a bad thing. Maybe that's exactly how God rebuilds the world again. And there's no question, God is present and active in this promise that Isaiah gives to us. The word of God stands forever. Go and say to the people, your God is here. God rules and repays and feeds and gathers and carries and leads. But God chooses to come home via a road that human beings build. God chooses to wait for a human announcer to proclaim the good news and open the doors of our hearts to receive God all over again. And that is really strange from the way that we understand power to work in the world. That is very strange from the point of view of how humans expect things to operate because we know that human beings are unreliable and incomplete And our desire for power as we understand it, well, thinks it would be much more efficient to just unilaterally reshape the world, right? But the good news is that God has bigger designs than that. The good news is that God has bigger designs than what we can imagine. What God is creating, this new world that Isaiah is announcing, this is not some permanent, fixed, continuous state of being. God is not creating infrastructure here. What God is creating is community. What God is creating is a new community of being in the world. And if you're going to create a community, the process is at least as important as the outcome. Really, if you're going to create a community, the process itself is the outcome. Because we learn how to depend on each other by depending on each other. We learn how to matter to one another by knowing that we matter to one another. And we know that any one of us, yes, is frail or unreliable. We are certain to let ourselves down and even more certain to let one another down. But God intends for us to depend on each other anyway. God intends for us to depend on each other anyway because it is that depending on each other that is the way God stands forever among us. The word of God stands forever among us through truth and trust and through forgiveness and generosity and grace. What God is creating among us is us. Last week, A few dozen of us went to Meals from the Heartland to package food to share with 
our neighbors in need all around the world, and there were 43 of us and a bunch of other people at other packing tables, and we, um, our group with some help from some of those other groups, uh, produced about one pallet worth of food every hour. Packaged it up, put it in the little bags, sealed the things shut, sealed the things shut again where they didn't quite seal, put it in a box, wrapped that all up, about one pallet every hour. A few years back, um, the executive director of Meals from the Heartland, Greg DeHai, came and spoke to us here at Covenant, and he said something that stuck with me. He said, it would be a lot faster for us to just put all of this food in a machine and have the machine zip through. It could package this food much, much faster than our human volunteers can do as we work together in that uh, assembly line. But that's not our whole mission. He said a key part of our mission is building a community around the work, building a community packaging that food together. Now, I got to tell Greg, it is pretty cool to watch uh, factory machines work too. I'd be happy to take 43 people down to the food packaging factory and we could just watch all the machines work. You remember that episode of Mr. Rogers, right? But Greg's right. That's not the point. The point is not how fast can we get the food packaged and put together. The point is for us to move our bodies together, to dance around each other in that work. The point is to hold those packages of food in our very own hands. The point is even for those sore muscles that we were nursing the next day to be part of our prayer for those in our world that we were serving that night. That's how God uses us to prepare the way. That's how God needs us to prepare the way to comfort each other, to encourage and to share the good news with each other because we are the reality that God is creating and bringing anew into the world. So we prepare the way for the kingdom of God to come live in us and between us through the way that we prepare within ourselves and with each other for God's coming into the world. So we bring down the mountains of our pride and the walls of our fear, and we raise up the valleys of sorrow, and we clear pathways for joy in what seems like wilderness around us. Next month, we're going to read Jesus' mother Mary singing a song about Jesus' coming birth, and she sings about the way that God turns the world upside down in Jesus. And she sings that as an invitation to us to prepare to turn our own lives upside down in Jesus as well. Friends, I have great news. We are grass and flowers, and we are becoming the soil where Jesus' life takes root again. Thanks be to God. Amen. I want to start off by thanking you all for your consistent support of the capital fund. Um, You've been loyal and, and dedicated in providing funds to be used for the special purposes that the capital fund is set up for. And we very much appreciate that. As a result of that, we've been debt-free since 2006. And we had debt at that time to, for the chancel edition, which was completed in 2000. Uh, It certainly is a good feeling, and I know it's one that a lot of churches don't enjoy when we encounter a project that's going to involve a fair amount of capital funds. It's nice to have that money in the account and and be able to write the check for it without having to worry about a special uh, campaign to raise money to to, uh, pay for the item. So that's much appreciated and um, we're very happy to be in that situation. You were provided with a handout that shows the history of the fund for the last 10 years. And uh, we took in slightly over 500000 We had expenditures of slightly over $500,000 in that 10-year period and took in $416,000. So 
in round numbers, um, on average, we were short about $9,000 a year. Now, the unique thing about the capital fund is it, it doesn't operate consistent with the operating budget. The operating budget has a, has a budget of expenses that are fairly consistent from year to year. There might be new things. The capital fund is there for the unexpected. Things break. They have to be repaired. They have to be replaced. And uh, that's unpredictable to some extent. That doesn't mean that all the things in the capital fund aren't predicted. The outline that was in your handout indicates some of the things that we're considering. Uh, looking forward, the large glass pane behind us does, probably doesn't look quite right. I tried to convince the property committee that that was the Holy Ghost making a personal appearance. <laughs> but they wouldn't buy it. So it's a broken seal and it has to be, the window has to be replaced. It can't be repaired. We talked about that and, and the consensus is that it has to be replaced. We've uh, put out bids and gotten approval from session to go forward with that. We have some other things listed in, in uh, the outline that you got, the handout, that we're looking at for the upcoming year. And many of those are just in the planning stage, so we don't have firm numbers yet, but some of them are going to be fairly costly. Updating the audiovisual system to fulfill its needs and looking at things like landscaping. Um, we have some certain items that have to be taken care of. We got some tree limbs on, on roofs and so forth um, that have to be addressed and other things uh, in the landscaping area might well be stretched out or over a number of years. I want to go back and just one thing I wanted to mention on our expenditures, that the largest item of the 10 years uh, 2014 through 2023 were the roofs. Now, before you conclude that that relates to the to the hailstorm, it has nothing to do with the hailstorm. Un unfortunately, we replaced many of our roofs within the, uh, Bob Anthony could tell you exact date, but within a, a few years of the hailstorm. So we had some pretty new roofs up there at the time the hail came through. So don't, don't look at these numbers and say, well, how much of that was hail? Not much. Okay. Um, we have a listing of items that we're looking at that, that you can go through. The, the last one is we have furnaces now that are 10 to 15 years old. In the 10-year period from 2014 to 10, 2023, we only spent $16,000 on furnaces. Well, that doesn't cover many furnaces these days. We have 14 furnaces. They're all working right now. <laughs> but, so that, those are some of the contingencies that we have to deal with as we look at uh, the capital fund for the upcoming year. The items that are dealt with uh, at the capital fund generally are brought to the the property committee, and the property committee is under the strong, very strong leadership of Deb Hayes. Deb spends an inordinate amount of time on matters relating to the property upkeep, as you all know, and we certainly appreciate her leadership. So I ask you to consider the above, consider the handout and the items as you make your pledge for 2025 to the capital fund. Perhaps some of you haven't, haven't uh, pledged before to the capital fund. I don't think everybody in the, in the congregation has. You might want to think about that and consider the above and consider the, the value and importance of, of having a church where we have no debt and we can pay our bills as, as we incur these expenses. Thank you.